We look for artists who push the boundaries of performance. We support the vague and obscure. We're looking to truly invest in the artist. This is a rare environment, and it's singularly positioned to support professional work. They are pursuing personal aesthetic missions. There was a poorly developed Polaroid of what the story was. I connected it directly to a very stark urban scene. There was death with beauty and mourning and rage all bound up together. It was about the actors. It was about physical vocabulary. A series of poetic monologues, rhythms, voices. It feels both very intimate and realistic and naturalistic. The Polaroid started to really develop and I knew I had something. I felt both proud and humble. Welcome to Angel City Culture Quest, where art, social justice, and the environment meet in Los Angeles. I am your host, Melina Paris, and I welcome you to this episode. Hello, culture lovers. This is your host, Melina Paris. For several months, we have been bringing you inspiring guests along with stimulating content about their work. As with anything, there are costs to keep this podcast going. So if you're able, join me in this quest with your support. Think of it as a cultural tip jar to share any amount that you're comfortable with. Or you can make a regular offering with as little as $4 a month. This will contribute to my ability to continue bringing you the great work of these artists, activists, and others, plus the cultural content that you want to hear about. I appreciate you, and I would be honored to have your support. To join, please go to our Patreon link at patreon.com forward slash Angel City Culture Quest. There, you can also see all of our past episodes, get early announcements, and find more perks to come. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Angel City Culture Quest. I'm your host, Melina Paris, and today I'm excited that we are speaking with two very special guests. Travis Preston, Cal Arts Center for New Performance Executive Artistic Director and Dean of Cal Arts School of Theater, and acclaimed playwright Octavio Solis, one of the most prominent Latino playwrights in America, to discuss his play, Scene with Cranes. Good afternoon, Travis and Octavio. How are you both? Really good. Well. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm glad to have you both here today. In celebration of its 20th anniversary season, we'll look at the ways Cal Arts Center for New Performance, or CNP, has been an incubator for testing, developing, and producing artistic projects and what Travis calls a truly different paradigm for creating professional work. And we'll speak with Octavio about Scene with Cranes and his process in writing it, including the varied symbols that cranes represent, and even an unexpected masterclass from one of the leads in this production. Cal Arts is one of the preeminent theater training grounds in the country, designed to educate the whole person and to prepare fully equipped theater artists to transform the field. Seen with Cranes is part of a project of Duende Cal Arts, an initiative of the Center for New Performance dedicated to developing and producing innovative work emerging from Latinx and Latin American communities and sources. Established in 2009 by Marisa Chibas, Duende Cal Arts develops adventurous projects at CNP that aim to expand aesthetic boundaries and performance discourse and advance multilingual works. The play will have a short run from September 29th to October 1st at Red Cat in downtown Los Angeles. And the program will include a pre-show talk with playwright Octavio in conversation with director Shi Wang Yang on Saturday, October 1st at 7.30 p.m. Here is some background on each of our guests. Travis Preston directs theater and opera throughout the world. 
Most recently, he completed the world premiere of Cal Arts Center for New Performances, Fantomas, Revenge of the Image, at the Wahen Theater Festival in China. Last July, he directed Sam Shepard's Buried Child for the 40th anniversary season of the Hong Kong Repertory Theater. He was awarded Chevalier of the Order of Arts and Letters by the French Minister of Culture for contributions to the arts in France and throughout the world. His first feature film, Astonished, received critical acclaim throughout the world, and Revolution, a film he produced, was invited to festivals in Florence, Rotterdam, London, and Houston, where it was awarded first prize. He has taught at many universities and theater training programs throughout the world, the Yale School of Drama, Columbia School of the Arts, New York University, the National Theater School of Denmark, Indiana University, Hong Kong Academy for the Performing Arts, and Harvard University. Author of over 20 plays, Octavio Solis's works both draw on and transcend the Mexican-American experience. He is a writer and director whose style defies formula, examining the darkness, magic, and humor of humanity with brutal honesty and characteristic intensity. His imaginative and ever-evolving work continues to cross cultural and aesthetic boundaries, solidifying him as one of the great playwrights of our time. Solis is the recipient of the Pew Charitable Trust U.S. Artist Fellowship, the Penn Center USA Award for Drama, the National Latino Playwriting Award, and Guest Artist Honoree for the William Ng Center for the Arts, among many other honors. Cal Art Center for New Performance was founded in 2002 by Susan Solt, Travis Preston, and Carol Bixler. From the start, CNP launched with Travis Preston's groundbreaking all-female production of King Lear, staged in six locations with the massive factory spaces of the Brewery Arts Complex in downtown Los Angeles. So Travis, can you tell us what does CNP look for in the artists it commissions and how does it discover its artists? Well, I would say that we look for artists who really push the boundaries of performance. And that can imply many different things. We are dedicated to following the artist. And in following the artist, we're taken into landscapes that we could not predict. That exists in a multiplicity of arenas. We actually sometimes create projects that are really taken to full performance. And at other times, we serve as a site of development. Mm -hmm. Because when I came to CalArts, I came as a guest artist, and I thought, oh, this is a rare environment. And it's singularly positioned to support professional work that was rapidly evaporating from the American scene because public support for the arts was being eviscerated. Mm. So we thought, actually, we could do something at CalArts that we couldn't do in other places, and it would have two very interesting components. The first was to serve our students in how they step into a professional world. And the second was how we could make a contribution to the American theater and to American performance that would not happen in other circumstances. And so we tend to support artists who are on a search. They're not really creating products as much as they are pursuing kind of personal aesthetic missions. And we try to get behind them and support them because they don't have a lot of support in other arenas. And it's certainly true that we have done works that are like Octavio's, that are writer based works. We have done works by directors who are seeking to devise pieces. So we don't have a lot of prejudice in terms of the nature of the work that we're supporting. Some of them are music based, for example. Cal Arts has an extraordinary music population. So we're really looking for things that cannot be easily produced in other circumstances or where the artists could not be produced easily in other circumstances or be supported in other circumstances. Now, sometimes that means they start out with extremely vague and obscure ideas. <laughs> and we love to support the vague and obscure. Uh, Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That sounds so nurturing for the artist. That's really central to what our principle is. The artists today 
It's very different from when I emerged as an artist. I went to the Yale School of Drama and then I graduated and there were a lot of opportunities. I don't think that that environment is actually as welcoming as it once was. And mm -hmm. so we really do want to nurture the artist, understanding that they are on a trajectory that requires really support the whole way. There are mechanisms for supporting emerging artists, but I would say that actually we need support as mid-career artists, and that's not often the case. That's not often available to people. That's wonderful. So how is this idea to adopt an artist and project-driven framework born? And can you talk a little more about the ways CNP invests in its artists? Well, the first is that most places program their activities on the creation of a season. And that season can be very adventurous or it can be very narrowly conceived, as the resident theater often is, but it's creating a season. So they need to fill a slot. When we follow the artist, we don't know how long a project will take. We don't know the ways in which it will develop, and we certainly don't know when we're going to make it happen because we're trying to allow the artist the luxury of time and space to evolve their ideas, to deepen their ideas. If I would have criticized more conventional production processes, I would have to say that, and I'm an artist who has to work in them often, I would have to say that we make our artists create their work too quickly. There are very few circumstances in which they can try things out and reject them or where they can have a series of workshops to develop their project more deeply. Certainly that was something that we were thinking about when we worked with Octavio. I wanted him to have a dedicated group of artists to work with who could work with him over time, and that would take the form of several workshops. Most of the time we're asked to create those same projects in a series of, if we're lucky, five weeks. And wow. then you're in front of an audience, right? Right into the fire. <laughs> right into the fire. So we're looking to truly invest in the artist. And that's a little different perspective than saying that we're investing in the product. Of course, we ultimately have produced some really exciting finished pieces. But a lot of the projects that we do are never seen. We're developing them. We're developing them with the artist. And sometimes those are not resulting in finished works, but we believe that the artist has had a rich, provocative experience that has moved their art forward. If we consider what we might do again with Octavio, I would encourage him to do something that he's never done before. Mm -hmm. to come into a room to work with some actors. And maybe he doesn't have a written piece when he walks into the room. Maybe that next process, Octavio, you just walk into the room, you do some things with some performers and with some designers, and you get the idea there. Maybe that's yeah. what we should look for next. That's wonderful. And I like that distinction you mentioned between investing in the production and investing in the artist. That's so unheard of. <laughs> I think it's great. And this following question is going to be for both of you to illustrate both the perspectives from Center for New Performance and then from Octavio as a CNP commissioned artist. But first, Travis, can you describe the ways that artist-led approach fortifies the artists as well as the works CNP produces? You've touched on that a little bit. Yeah, I think that, again, when the artists understand that we don't have an agenda in where, in how they follow their impulses and the promptings of their heart, that we actually will move with them and support them as they excavate their own imagination. I think it's a different environment, and it certainly creates a different spirit. And that spirit is central to it. And, and then, of course, we want to surround them with fellow travelers, people who are also searching and are open to supporting in profound ways. And, and that's one of the reasons why I sought to pair Octavio and his work with Chi Wong Yang, who is the director of the piece, because I felt, and this is telling tales out of school, but 
I believe that Octavios had to thrive in resident theater circumstances where you're actually given very little time to develop a piece、mm-hmm. and very little rehearsal time before you have to present it in front of an audience.、And、I knew that Chi Wong was an artist who would invest in the piece and in Octavio in a different way, and that's more than just getting to opening night. <laughs> Thank you. That's right. That's how it works. That's what's so wonderful about this process. And everything that Travis has described about how CMP works with its commissioned artists has been brought to bear on almost every step, on every step of my process in writing and, and working on Seeing with Cranes. From its very inception, they had asked me what was a concern I had that I wanted to explore, the story I wanted to tell. I even still have the original proposal for Seeing with Cranes. And、I described the play. I described how I was influenced very much by John Sibelius's work titled "Scene with Cranes," and how that work had somehow created for me a kind of a dim, vaguely poorly developed Polaroids, dim images of what the story was. But then there was more clarity as I was coming along, and especially once I wrote the proposal. But I didn't even have names. I started out with the mother, the daughter, the neighbor, the father, the detective, the police detective, the cousin, and finally also the dead boy. I called him the dead boy.、Uh, I, I didn't even have names for、yeah. them, and they were excited with that idea that I would work with this piece by Sibelius, someone who is far from my culture, far from anything that is part of my makeup, from Finland, no less. And he had composed this this piece for a play called Kualima. It translates as death. Back in 1903, and yet when I heard it, I connected it directly to a very stark urban scene. But there was still the same concerns with death, with beauty, and a kind of mourning and rage all bound up together. And I just felt like I wanted to use that piece in an ekphrastic way, responding to it, having the music tell its own story to me. And I used it in this proposal, and they said, "Sure." They commissioned me to do that, and so I started. Okay, well now I have to write the play. And then pretty soon they had auditions, and I said, "Okay, you know, here's what I'll do. Instead of writing the play and hurrying so I can get, have it for auditions, I'll just write a series of like poetic monologues for each of the characters." And I brought that in, and that's what everyone auditioned with. But I had very much decided that the mother was going to be played by Marisa Chivas. I somehow misinterpreted the commission that she offered me for La Duende Arts as、mm-hmm. something that would be scripted for her. I completely misread the signals. She <laughs> wanted me to write a play for La Duende Arts, but she was quite surprised when I wrote it for her when the role was designed with her in mind. But I auditioned myself as if I were the director. All these young people for the roles, and and I even had help from staff members and other instructors at Cal Arts who I met that day, who would offer their help in providing music or rhythms or even warm ups, so I could see how they all work. And I saw them in in small groups, and from there I had them audition with these monologues. I didn't even have a play at the time. That was oh my goodness, that was remarkable. So I cast it, and now that I knew who was going to be in it, now that I knew what they were capable of, now that I had faces and voices and bodies, the Polaroids started to really develop themselves in my mind, and so writing the play came easily. And before long, I had my very first draft, which I sent to Travis. And I have never heard anyone sound so enthusiastically buoyant about my work when they read it. Travis just said, "Oh my God, this is great! This is fantastic! We're, we'll do this. This is amazing!" And I, and I just was a little bowled over by that. But I asked him for one thing. I said, "The next phase was to do a workshop with these young actors and with Marisa." And I said, "Please, could I direct that workshop?" Because I have things I wanted to try out in terms of the structure of physics of this play, that I wanted to see if directing them in the workshop would enhance my understanding of how the play worked. And I told them I have no intention of directing it myself in the end, but let me do the first workshop. And they said sure. So they let me develop this on my own terms, which was wonderful. And I felt tremendous freedom. I felt tremendous trust in the organization at Cal Arts while I worked on this. And it was so satisfying, really, truly satisfying. And I knew I had something. 
and the workshop came off. And I knew then we could go on with the rest of the process. And I remember at the time when Travis read the play and he saw the workshop that I was doing, he said, let me find a right director for you. He came up with Chi Wong, who is one of the instructors there and a fine acting teacher and a director who has a very really intuitive, organic way of working that is in keeping with a kind of philosophy, an approach that everyone there is familiar with at CalArts. So I said, sure. And I'd never worked. I even I didn't even know Chi Wong, but I trusted his choice. And we were about to work in 2020, work toward a production. We were about to go into the next workshop, but everything was interrupted by the pandemic. Yeah. And our world stopped. It stopped cold. Theater, for all intents and purposes, disappeared all around the world. Every performance just ceased to be. And uh, we all kind of went into this incredible mass hibernation for a number of years that really kind of struck us all, including me, at the very foundations of what we're about. And for a while, I thought, especially when on TV, they were saying in the news that it would take five years before a vaccine would be developed. I thought, I'm done. I'm done. I might as well retire. I'm quitting. I'm going to just write poetry and novels. And I'm mm. done. I'm a theater artist. I, I can't do this. And it really affected me. Luckily, we, we had a vaccine. We back from our underground state, like pharaohs just emerging out of, out of our tombs. We were mummified for a while. <laughs> uh, isn't that crazy? That's we're a good description. Mummified. Yeah. And, uh, I like that. And it affected the play. It affected how I did the play. And then I suddenly felt that the play, which was written before the pandemic, was really a kind of response to the pandemic now. Mm. I felt like, I felt like the themes of, of, of uh, grief, and rage and loss and the beauty associated with all that, the terrible beauty associated with all that was present in this work and enriched by our experiences during this pandemic. And so as we came back, we came back with masks. We came back very carefully. Chi Wong had a workshop and that workshop was about the play and we heard the next draft and he tried some things. And then there was yet another workshop that he scheduled that wasn't even about the script. It was about the actors. It was about the roles they were playing and creating mm. kind of physical vocabulary for the way this play works. So we just explored for a while and I was there ready to write and I thought we were going to be examining the script and doing reading a lot of the script. And we're, No, it wasn't about that. They were on their feet. They were lying down. They were interacting with each other in a really interesting and organic way that ultimately compelled me. I couldn't help but just watch and listen and then respond through my writing quietly to what they were doing. In fact, I'm not sure I should have even been in the room, but I'm glad I insisted on coming because I then understood what Chi Wang was about. I mm -hmm. understood uh, how he puts his world together. I understood his theory of relativity, so to speak. And I wanted to embed that into the work in a deeper way. And so it was wonderful. And here's the next thing, the next part of the process that I found really tremendous. And that's that there was another workshop that was scheduled earlier this year. And that workshop was for designers, for the director, myself, and the designers, no actors. And so we built a mock-up of the set, really sort of very simple walls. And there were instruments that were hung. There were costume pieces that were brought in. There were soundscapes that were introduced. And with, with the environment for three mm -hmm. days, just trying shit. Excuse my language, pardon That's me. Okay. <laughs> pardon, pardon my English. But it was really terrific. And I just found that fascinating. I said, why haven't we ever worked like this before? Yeah. And and I found that that also helped me in the next rewrite of the play. So every step of the way, I found that the play was growing and getting enriched by these artists and this process in very surprising and unorthodox ways. And I felt myself at the center of it, but also not the most important feature of it, which is like, wow, I felt both proud and humbled at the same time. That's amazing. So many times you're speaking, I'm thinking, what a gift. So ultimately, it's gifts exponentially. That's wonderful. Yeah, and I don't want to work any other way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't blame you. 
and and the and, and I hate to say this, but to phrase it in this way, but I don't know that we could have done it without the pandemic. I think we needed the interruption of the pandemic to have us all take stock of who we are, of what we mean to the world, and our relationship to each other as artists. And we had to redefine all that. We had to make the rule book all over again from scratch. And it really helped us. I think it really, really helped us. If you're just tuning in, today we are speaking with Travis Preston, Cal Art Center for New Performance Executive Artistic Director and Dean of the Cal Arts School of Theater, and acclaimed playwright Octavio Solis in discussion of his play, Scene with Cranes. Thank you for listening. You know, what's interesting also with these actors is, you know, we've, we've gone through several versions of the script and there's things I try and then I take out and stuff, but they all remember that. They all remember the exact lines and they say, hey, remember when we did this? Or someone says, hey, um, I want to say this about my, I, I, you know, I know my character is this. And I said, well, you know, it's he's not that anymore because I, I changed that. I cut it. <laughs> I said, oh, oh, but I still have, feel it present in the world. Yeah. I said, That's okay. It's subtext. It becomes your subtext. So they can, exactly. they can use that. All, everything that was in the prior scripts, it's in them already. That's the benefit of having a very consistent cast. Of our cast of eight, five of them have been with us from the very beginning. That's great. Like you were mentioning the other day, it's just like a family. I want to offer a description of the play so people have an understanding of it. Octavio is known for plays of satire, mythology, and steely realism. In this season's premiere production, a tight-knit East L.A. family is left shattered in the wake of their youngest son's mysterious death. Devastated, the mother retraces her son's final steps in search of the truth. In a blend of classic and contemporary, Octavio parallels Jean Sibelius' musical masterwork in a play of the same name. Shi Wang Yang's direction of Scene with Cranes has been called exquisitely visceral as it navigates the many avenues of loss. I would like to talk a little bit about grief and comedy. In the play, with those many avenues of loss, what especially stands out to me is your use of humor and grief in this story. First, I'll touch on the grief, which there are different kinds of in the play. There's, of course, the family's grief for Nico, the boy, and there is Lourdes, who carries a very difficult grief for her husband, who he was before and now because of his health circumstances. And then you mentioned before when we spoke the larger overarching grief, both for the characters like Angel and what his life could have been, but also for what's happening with the urban renewal and gentrification amid the building cranes in this very environment that they live in. And additionally, Octavio, you are adept at comedic timing in the character's delivery of lines, that troublesome screen door, and Lorde's repeated deadpan refrain to fix it, or how Yoli, Ruby, and Letty provoke each other into taking a tragic selfie on their devices. The realism of the characters is striking. We know these people very well. And that's just from my reading of the play. I'd venture to say the story even has operatic tones. Marissa Chibas, who plays Lourdes, the mother in the play, commissioned you, as you mentioned, to write something for Duende Calarts. And the musical piece, Seen with Cranes, is beautiful and emotive. Can you talk about why you chose it to go with this particular story? It's because I experienced that. I was listening to the piece, and it was performed by Kremerata Baltica, a Latvian orchestra with Gidon Kremer, who's their chief violinist, but also their leader and conductor. And I was listening to it and I was really taken with the piece and I had the TV on at the same time on mute. And the news was playing and the news was showing this live scene of a parent drive-by shooting or some shooting that happened in a really tough neighborhood. And I saw Latino faces. I saw a woman who looked Mexican or Salvadoran or something who they brought to the camera underneath a yellow tape to ask her questions about like, what happened and, and and the loss in her family because it was someone close. I couldn't make all the details out because it was on mute, 
But I'm watching this woman who's obviously tremendously grief stricken being forced into the cameras to talk about her loss as it just happened. And while I'm listening to the music and I just mm. felt like there was a correlation between what I was hearing and what I was seeing. And I said, I think that's a story. I think that's a play. I think there's something there for me to continue exploring. So I started writing some things down. The story unfolded as a kind of uh, poem. I started to write it like an outline very quickly, but I hate outlines because they're so predictive. It also feels like an essay, like I'm working on a theme <laughs> paper. But I said, what if I write it like a poem very quickly and see if I could do it in 10, 12 pages and just write it, write out what happens in it and use every tool as a writer that I have to make it evocative, to not make it feel so pedantic and prosaic. And so I did it while I was listening to the music. As I'm listening to it, I'm playing it. And then I realized that that piece itself had to be in the work at the end of the play, at the end of it. And I said, okay, I understand how this works now. So the piece wasn't just influencing me, guiding me through my story. It was telling me I'm part of the story. I'm in there. So I had to do it. And then when I looked at the title and I saw a scene with cranes, I thought, oh, they are the birds, the cranes themselves. But it can also be those building cranes, those large building cranes that we see when they're putting up new structures, which often come at the expense of entire neighborhoods that are raised or demolished and people are moved out. Mm -hmm. And I said, there's something here. There's something to explore there. I did some research on the piece itself, found out that Tiberius had written it for his brother-in-law, who was a playwright who had married, his, I think, his sister. And the play was called Kualima, which means death, and was performed. But then the play went nowhere, and, and Sibelius took out the various incidental music pieces that he'd written for this play, and he turned them into individual pieces that were like the dark waltz, and then this very elegiac piece, seen with cranes. And I learned also that cranes in Nordic culture are a symbol for death. They're a harbinger of death. But in other cultures, they're also a omen of birth and rebirth or renewal. And so I thought that would fit Venn very well with this work because it's also like urban renewal, like the building of yeah. new at the same time that there's death because there's some neighborhoods that are disappearing. And so I thought that since the cranes work in this dualistic way, opposite each other, the, this theme of life, birth and death, I thought this would be a very good symbol for my play itself. And at the center of it was a boy who reminds me very much of myself growing up in these neighborhoods that are at risk and who is always listening to that particular music. It's his way of disappearing from the harshness, the violence, and the negativity of his present circumstances. Wow. You had to title it Scene with Cranes. It yeah. had to, there had to be. <laughs> And it's funny because I have this great comic timing because I, I don't I don't think of myself as a funny guy. I don't write jokes. <laughs> and so I'm surprised that people find humor in the work. That's humanity. That's life. That's what we do. And it was perfect. I loved it. You know, there's something also that Chi Wong has, because I, I start to play with the three young girls, keening and wailing. When you first see them, it's like really touching and it's a little haunting, a little scary. But then the wailing goes on and they build on each other, almost like one is egging the other to so see them wail more. And it gets almost to, it does get, in fact, to a really ridiculous level that I feel like, oh gosh, that's too much, too long. You really need to tone this down. But I think, no, this is what is operatic about the work. <laughs> yeah. it's extremely funny. So I said, no, that's appropriate. It feels right. I'm always sort of like, I, I make these bold choices. And then as I see people trying them, I go, no, maybe I need to walk it back, walk it back a little bit. But Chi Wong is like, and the actors are, no, let's keep pushing forward. Let's, <laughs> let's see how far we can take this. So operatic is a very good word to describe how this play works. It feels both very intimate and realistic and naturalistic, in fact, and at the same time, the emotions are so epic, larger than life. And the grief and the emotions are also so crystallized, crystalline, that they transcend regular workaday quotidian life. Yeah. And when we hear the musical piece and the clarinets in it, as they respond right. with the marked emphasis of the mm -hmm. clarinet's six calls, it represents the cranes calling out. 
And what you did with that, the visceral way Angel describes it, and the scene with Lourdes was in itself transcendent, just like the cranes. Yep, because I definitely knew that Angel just couldn't be just the villain of the piece. It looked like I wanted him to be the villain of the piece. But I said, no, I think even this character has to transcend that. And I remember, and I wrote this in the play, my dramaturg, Micah Espinosa, she said um, that, that he's also a kid, that Angel's also a kid who barely even knows who he is. He doesn't even know himself yet, except he's got this life and this stature he's, a, he's supposed to live up to. He's mm-hmm. being the next, the next b- big yard dog, you know? Yeah. And I took that to harness it. That has to be a line. That has to become explicit. There's so many ways in which I owe a debt of gratitude to my dramaturg and to every one of the actors, and even Chi Wong, for offering insights that then I go, oh, that's a great line. I got to write that down. Sorry, it's mine. It's mine now. <laughs> But no, I'm not even like that. And and they're not like that either. We're just, yeah. you know, we're building this beast together. And it's a terrible, but a beautiful beast. We're all feeling like we're lurching to be born, to find out how the world is different at the end of the work and how we are all changed by it. It's tremendous. And you know, the best thing about this, especially this rehearsal process, we started on August 8th. We started on August 8th, five days a week, working in L.A. and then now in back at CalArts. And so in this immediate process, we've had all that time to dream ourselves further into the play and into the story. So there's a kind of commitment where every performer feels the stakes are very high. I even feel that from the understudies who have come and observed and are living the work by watching them. So many of them are already off book. And please talk about Marissa's master class. Well, every time she's called on to bring Lourdes forth, she takes her time. There's a concentration that she has. She says, I I have an active rest where she lies down, puts her feet up and puts uh, one of those yoga blocks on her head and meditates and runs through the text in her head. And then she quietly gets up and gets ready. And she's there rehearsing and performing with her former students. These are people that she taught, and they get to see the compendium of her lessons and her education, of their education, as she taught it, in action now, in play. They get to see it in play. And not only that, they get to interact with it. And she's even prouder to be acting with her students because she sees how capable they are of raising the bar for her, and then she raises it for them, and then You know, after a while, it's like they're all equals. They're equals now. This is the aim of every instructor, every acting instructor, is to create the kind of performer that they can then be their equal. And so uh, Marissa isn't there as as a teacher. She's there as a colleague. She's there as as a scene partner. And they're all feeding off of that. And she's feeding off of them as well. It is a masterclass. That's so wonderful that that could all come together that way. And... It just sounds like a luxurious environment for artists to thrive in. He has seen a lot of that, haven't you, Travis? Yes. It's pretty interesting with the process that's gone on as long as this, obviously because of the pandemic. But I do think you're right, Octavio, that it has positively served the piece. And I'm happy that it's having its culmination now. Everything that's happened in the course of the process is contributing to the work. That's wonderful. Well, before we go, can you each tell us where we can find you on social, on your websites, and wherever else? It's on OctaviaSolis.net. You can find access to my other works there as well. I'm on Facebook, too, as Octavia Solis. But I urge everyone to come see this play at Red Cat. It is nothing like a live experience. And this is the kind of play that really feels better when you see it live. Although we are streaming a single performance on uh, Saturday night, I believe. Oh. It's only the one night that it's happening. That's good to know. Uh, we already started teching yesterday. The set is gorgeous, and we're not it's not even finished, but we have more days to go. It's a beautiful piece. Thank you very much. The thing about the pandemic is that I had COVID, and it hit me pretty hard. So I'm behind on all my other projects, and writing has become a real hard task, and it never felt like a task before. 
So that I got this far with seeing with cranes, which took everything I had in me to get to this point, it just feels so satisfying and gives me the encouragement to then pursue my other works. Moreover, it's like, what a way to come back from this hibernation. I couldn't have planned it better. It had to be this work that would hold my hand and guide me back. It's the perfect vehicle for that. I thank you for sharing that with us. I really appreciate that. And congratulations on completing this mm. beautiful work. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. It just feels so satisfying. And Travis, is there any parting words you would like to share? Yeah, I actually, I've really tremendously enjoyed this opportunity to talk about the process. It is gratifying that Octavio's piece really inaugurates our 20th anniversary season, I invite people to engage centerfornewperformance.org, which is our website. And I'm really grateful to you, Melina, for giving us this opportunity to advance this discourse because there aren't that many venues in which to do it. So I'm grateful to you for this. We come back, we're finding that the arts are woefully ignored. And so that you are doing this is uh, very important, very significant for our sake. So I appreciate it very much. Oh, thank you very much. We need to support the arts. And I will put the link to where to get the tickets in my show notes. And there'll be more information about the play and the cast in there as well. So I urge everybody to go see this play. And with that, thank you both. Melina, thank you for having me on your program. I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Thank yeah. you. And thank you, Travis. I, I am so happy you guys were both here and could talk about this wonderful play. Thank you. Take care now. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.